What's up, you guys, and welcome back to the Televised Podcast. My name is Anna, and today we're going to be talking about Supergirl Season 6, Episode 7, titled Fear Not. This episode was uh, the mid-season finale of Supergirl Season 6, so that means that we are, unfortunately, halfway through the final season of Supergirl. So upsetting genuinely um but i think i don't know for me personally i know a lot of people have a lot of issues uh, with 6a and what it was but i i don't know i think they did the best of with, with what they had i think that they um implemented a lot of important uh character development for the characters um for characters who aren't Kara because they had the time to do it and they had the opportunity to do it. And I think that was really important, um, especially going into the rest of the season, for them to have set all of this stuff up so that there's no need for, um, you know, uh, like, to take... So that they don't have to just, like, build something up, like, super duper quick at the end, you know, especially, like, for Kelly as Guardian, there was, like, this huge build-up to that in this episode, this huge, um, thing where, <laughs> like, in this episode with Kelly as Guardian, there was this huge, uh, moment where you're like, oh, shit, like, now she's gonna become Guardian and this is the thing that's gonna do it. And I think that was so important, especially in you know, not just having her suddenly become Guardian in one episode later this season, you know what I mean? So, I think it was, I think they did the best with what they could, with what they had, and the, the best with, uh, what they, yeah, with, just with, like, what they had, what they could do with the time that they were given without their lead, basically. I mean, you know, it's, it was an unbelievably difficult thing to do, and I think that they did it pretty well. Um, so this week, I am not going to be talking about Batwoman in this episode because since I am going to just be going back to Batwoman only recaps next week, I'm just going to talk about 213 and 214 all in the same episode next Wednesday, um, just to kind of like make it a little easier just so that, uh, I can talk a little bit about episode 213 and then obviously how it's going to lead into episode 214. So I just thought that I'd save it for then so that I could have just like one cohesive Batwoman thought uh, rather than kind of split it with Supergirl this week. Um, so yeah, I just, I don't know. I, I have a lot of good feelings about the Supergirl season so far. I mean, obviously it's not perfect. Obviously there are issues with it, but I, I think that this for me is like the best I could have asked for with, again, kind of given the, the situation and given what, what they had to deal with. And then also just like in telling the stories that we care about, because clearly, I mean, Nia has taken a big front seat in these, uh, couple of episodes and, and Brainy has taken a big front seat, Lena, um, Alex and her emotions and even Kelly, especially in this episode, even though I think we needed to see more of Kelly in this first half of the season, I think it was, it was silly to leave her out of a, quite a few, quite a number of episodes, especially the ones where the other super friends were in it. Obviously, I mean, there wasn't really room for anybody in the Midvale episodes, like, that's understandable, but, like, come on now. <laughs> I thought that we learned that we want to see Kelly on screen, at least I do. Um, but yeah, I don't know, that's, I just, I kind of like it. So, but let's talk about the episode, and then I'll kind of talk a, a bit more at the end, I guess, about my overall feelings. But the episode starts out with the Phantom Zone. So it turns out Kara was able to save her dad from that explosion. The episode kind of picks off, picks up, like, immediately after the, um anchor explodes and I was like oh shit like she managed to like save her dad and then at the end of the episode they revealed that Nixley even survived that explosion so it was like okay <laughs> the huge cliffhanger from like a number of episodes ago just kind of became obsolete but it's fine it's fine um <laughs> So Kara is helping Zora walk with his injury and and she gets slashed by a phantom which shows Kara her worst fear. And her fear is that all of her friends die 
and that it's all her fault. Um, very reminiscent of of things that we already know about Kara. I mean, looking at the hundredth episode, there was that one scene where she was like, "Every day I wake up, or it's it's difficult to wake up because I think that every day I might get my friends killed." And that's definitely it's definitely on par for Kara. And it was it was really sad though to see Kara so hopeless in this this episode. But we'll get to that a bit later. Um, on Earth, Nia and Brainy arrive back with Clara's blood, and it turns out that they were gone for three whole days, and Brainy says, he says, I am a terrible time traveler. <laughs> and so while they were gone, the super friends made preparations and have Magan patrolling in their absence. Um, and then the tower turns into a spaceship with, uh, Martian technology. <laughs> the, like... Listen, the image is cool of the, like, tower opening up and then a ship flying out. But also, I think any of the people in downtown National City were like, what in the, what the, wh what? <laughs> but I guess, like, aliens are just so common now, at least in National City, they're just, like, so common that it's just whatever, I guess. <laughs> um, but that's fine. Uh... <laughs> Um, so Kelly is there too. So all the super friends are there. They'd all been working on stuff in the meantime. And apparently, um, in the meantime, while they're going to be gone in the phantom zone, cause that's their whole mission. They're going to the phantom zone. Uh, Magan is going to be patrolling in their absence. So she's the only one of the super friends actually missing from this episode. Um, and so Kelly actually inputs Car's blood into the Q-Wave interface and the phantom gets Supergirl sent. Um, and then Jean establishes that the phantoms show fear visions while in their home dimension and that everybody has to be careful. And then they actually ask Kelly to, like, give them advice on managing fear. So she gets to be a therapist for a minute and she gives them some advice on how to manage it. And she says that she uses grounding techniques to pull people out of their fears. And it was very much like group therapy and it needs to happen more often. <laughs> So she basically says, like, you, think of something that you could see, smell, touch, whatever. Think of those. And, and if your fear is not something that is real, it's not, if it's not one of those, then it's not real. Then you can pull yourself out of it. And so they also establish, because of that, that they, that Kara, because she's been in the Phantom Zone for so long, she'll need a touchstone, uh, someone to pull her out of her own fears, and Alex volunteers and pushes back against Jean's orders, who, Jean says, it's gonna be me, because I can just, like, get in and out of there really quick, I don't need you, human Alex Danvers, <laughs> going poking around in the Phantom Zone, okay? And so then, also, Lena, in the meantime, had created a yellow sun, like, supercharge bomb and very sweet wonderful Kara's little yellow sun uh, <laughs> and they also established that the phantoms might attack their shields which would then cause it to disable which is bad news bears bad news guys um all the super friends have their own little stations in the t in the tower in the little spaceship it's so cute and I just I mean every time we see anything about the tower I'm like okay why why did we not destroy the DEO earlier? Why, why did we not have the tower for like two seasons? Because this place is so sick. <laughs> you know, and it's like, oh my god, so many missed opportunities. <laughs> um, and also, in like the longest running intro without a commercial break or like a anything like that, we see these, like, this massive kind of, like, a uh, block of time. At least for me, I was like, oh my god, this feels like it's going on forever and ever and ever. There hasn't even been a commercial yet. Um, so Alex confronts Jean and says that she needs to be Kara's touchstone when there was a power surge and turbulence on the ship. So after a blinding white flash, Alex noticed that the Phantom is out of containment, so her and Jean go to investigate. It suddenly appears behind Jean, but Alex fights him off, not, but not without getting a slash on her neck in the process. Uh, Jean says that Alex needs to go into containment, but Alex fights back because she says she needs to be out there in the field getting Kara back. 
So Jean ends up bringing Alex to containment, and she pretends like she's going to go in there, but she kicks Jean in instead and locks him in there. And Alex, like, goes back to the main room and lies about where Jean is. But her phantom transformation um, is drawing phantoms to their ship, which is destroying their shields because they keep attacking it. So Alex decides to sacrifice herself to save everybody by jumping off the ship. It's like this crazy escalation of things where it was like, uh, first, you know, Alex is talking about rescuing Kara. Then all of a sudden the phantom is out. Then all of a sudden Alex is like slashed on the neck. She's going to turn into a phantom. Then all of a sudden Jean is in a cage. Then all of a sudden the shields are going down. Then all of a sudden Alex decides to lock herself between the doors so that she can just jump out and sacrifice herself to the phantom zone. And it was just crazy. I'm like, what is going on? <laughs> So it turns out that Alex's biggest fear, and that's what we find out uh, as the episode obviously progresses, but like before that, we had no idea. We're like, holy shit, what is happening? But as it turns out, that was just Alex's biggest fear, and her biggest fear is being a liability to Kara's rescue. Or, I mean, just like letting her emotions control her to the point that she ends up like hurting those around her. So then we're tacked back 10 minutes and we focus instead on Lena and she has this wonderful conversation with Nia which is genuinely so adorable. I love the two of them. I love how they were able to bond over losing their mothers. Lena asks Nia about her gloves that convert dream energy into physical form. So I guess that's where the telephone wire uh, aspect of her powers comes from. Um, and Nia says that Brainy made them for her. And I mean, listen, guys, I, it w- I would be remiss if I... <laughs> It wouldn't be an episode of this podcast if I didn't say that there was a parallel between Supercorp and Brainia again, but there is. Because, I mean, in this exact same episode, Lena made Kara that yellow sun bomb. And, I mean, come on, the anti-kryptonite suit? The whole entire anti-kryptonite suit. Like, come on now. Um, like, mm-hmm. <sighs> It's fine. Um, So Nia says that she doesn't know how they work and that she should know more, but the only person who can help her is gone. Lena says that losing her mom doesn't get any easier, especially in light of the family that she herself has left, but Nia says that it's a good thing that the super friends are their family now. Um, And that was so, that's just so cute. I just love that they can bond so well because they are so similar. Um, I mean, uh, there's so much connection between the two of them, and I, I really just love, and I mean, obviously, also, the fact that Katie and Nicole are such good friends that you could just, like, tell that they have so much fun working together, but I also just, like, their characters blend so well together, especially after, um, the episode where, uh, Lena cried because she saw Dreamer uh, giving her speech on TV. Like, you know, there's just so much to connect the two of them that I'm so glad that they are finally, like, working together and get to have scenes together and get to connect. And, um, yeah, it just, I love it. And uh, so Lena actually, in this conversation, brings up the book of fairy tale, f- of folk tales of her mother's that was mentioned in uh, A Few Good Women, uh, the season five episode uh, t- two? Two? Maybe two? I don't know. Uh, (laughs) It's called A Few Good Women. It was the flashback episode of, uh, no, it's not called A Few Good Women. Confident, no. Yeah, Confidence Women. That's what it's called. Okay, A Few Good Women was episode two of this season. Confidence Women was the episode, um, where there was the whole flashback to Lena and Andrea when they were young. And that's when Lena, that was kind of established her um, connection with her mother, as well as Katie in that wig, (laughs) as well as this book of folktales. So it comes back in this episode, and she says that that is what connects her to her mother. And she tells Nia that her powers connect her to her own mother. Um, and you know what? I mean, Lena said something in this episode. She said, there's a part of you, it feels like there's a part of yourself that you'll never understand. And I mean, guys, I think, 
I think that our favorite human, Lena Luther, is not going to be a human for the entirety of this season. I think it's going to be revealed that she either has some kind of power or she has some kind of alien blood or or something like that. I mean, that that comment just like did not feel casual. It did not feel coincidental. I just don't see her staying a human for for the entirety of the season. I just can't. I don't. Uh-uh. <sighs> we'll see, I guess. But and then, uh, you know, I just I don't know. I um, I don't know. We'll see. But I mean, personally, I would prefer if she did stay a human. That's just me, though. I mean, I had this conversation when we thought that Ryan was potentially, like, an alien uh, on Batwoman. I kind of talked about it a lot where I was like, I think I really value um, superheroes that don't have any powers. And I think especially, like, a a character like Lena, whose main power is her mind and also her heart, I would have a hard time, I think, with uh, reconciling if she was an alien or something like that. But I don't know. I... Anything that's not just about torturing Lena, I'm down for, so. (laughs) Um, Also, I think this episode for me, just like with Nia constantly, you know, talking about her mom, this episode proved to me that Nia is the one holding herself back. Like, she doesn't actually need the uh, coaching of her mother. She doesn't need really, she doesn't need any information from her sister either. She just needs to believe in herself. And I'm just anxiously waiting for that moment of her believing in herself. And I wonder too, I mean, we all kind of thought that this plot might be leading to a potential reconciliation with her sister. As much as I obviously would love to see that because I think it needs to happen, I also think that they could take it a different direction and be like, hey, I don't need to ask anything of my sister because I believe in myself and I I can do this for myself. So we'll see. I don't know. <laughs> but I just, I think that this episode proved to me that um, she's uh, definitely, it's in her own mind, you know, the the fact that she, she has like a complex about it, you know, it's not the actual lack of education on her part about her powers, it's her lack of confidence in herself in her powers, you know. So then there's the white flash and Lena sees that there is a coolant link, a, a coolant leak and goes off to fix it. There's a ton of water on the floor and it turns into a big creepy water monster. Uh, she runs back to the main room and all her friends are drowned except Dreamer who Lena's actually able to kind of save. Uh, they run to the med bay and Lena remembers that it's it's a kelpie. It's a shapeshifter that drags people underwater. I guess it's it's it was in the book of folktales. <laughs> It was in it from, and I guess Lena says that she would read it over and over to punish herself for the guilt that consumes her over watching her mother drown. Uh, Nia then drowns, and Lena realizes that she is actually in her nightmare, and she, like, names off all the things that she can see, smell, hear, touch, whatever, and one of them, she says, is my friends, and it's just so sweet, like, it just, I love that Lena is fully integrated, I mean, I said this before, but I love that she's fully integrated into the super friends, it just feels so organic and feels so long overdue, you know, um, So then there's this super fun alien reference uh, with Lena pushed against the wall and the Kelpies like in her face. Very much that like Sigourney Weaver uh, horror moment with the Kelpie. Um, And actually, I mean, the whole episode itself is basically a long horror reference. There's a lot of uh, referential moments in the episode and I thought it was done really well. David Harewood directed this episode and I thought it was done like really well, especially with that fun kind of Kelpie Sigourney Weaver moment uh, for Lena. So then we go back again to 10 minutes earlier and Brainy approaches Kelly and he says that he's been challenged by his emotions and he says that he feels safer when she's on board to kind of help everybody kind of cope. And Kelly says that she's actually still feeling subpar and kind of nervous about even the tower and especially phantoms after her encounter with Magan and the phantoms from the last time and and how how little she felt she was able to do uh, in that situation. 
then a white flash. And Kelly noticed that the Q-Wave interface is messed up, and Lena and Dreamer had gone off to check on the power core, and Kelly actually goes after them to ask Lena about the Q-Wave thing. In the containment room, she finds the two of them in front of the Phantom's cage, and they are now possessed. And then Alex steps out, and she's possessed too. And they all talk in unison, and it's like super creepy. And they say that Kelly is weak and human, and that they, uh, they, they themselves, if 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 they can succumb to the influence of the Phantom, then what chance does Kelly stand? Basically, and Kelly pleads with Alex, and there's this this one wonderful moment of Kelly kind of like recounting their entire relationship starting at the hospital and ending at Alex asking her to move in and she says that asking uh, being asked to move in with Alex was genuinely one of the best things that's ever happened to her and and Ozzy killed this entire scene she just like the whole entire time was just so in it and just the tears and everything. I just, it was so good. And she conveyed Kelly's love for Alex so clearly. And I just loved it. Um, and so she's able to actually pull Alex out of it, but not for long. Um, Alex pushes Kelly to the escape pod, but there's only room for one. And then she is, Alex, I mean, is repossessed. And then they all converge on Kelly. I think, too, that the scene of uh, Alex and Kelly really reminded me of um, the scene between Kara and Metallo Lena from the 100th episode where, you know, Kara was kind of pleading with Lena and and, and, uh, trying to recall her memories or whatever, and, and it just, like, doesn't work. It doesn't, uh, it's, it's no use to, like, kind of, um, change her, I guess, you know? And, and Kelly obviously has a little bit of success with Alex, but not for very long, you know? I mean, she's able to snap her out of it, but not for a truly substantial amount of time. And I mean, just again, that kind of, like, hero, like, um, Uh, one begs with their significant other who is like possessed or different or evil or whatever and to try and change or to try and uh fight it or to to be better and it just is that kind of like classic trope that I think I mean we've seen again with like Supercorp and with Brainy and Nia in the same you know in season five too and just so many parallels (laughs) So then they go back another, back 10 minutes again. So we're back again to the same time. And this time we're with Nia and she's immediately shown a dream where the phantom has escaped and all that's in his cell is a thimble with the tower on it with a crack across it. So Brainy wakes Nia up and says that everybody had fear visions, but that it's okay now. Uh, Nia insists that something is wrong, so they both go down there to check the containment. Um, Brainy confronts Nia and says that she's had trouble interpreting her dreams before and that he can't fully trust her without the full training. And I knew immediately, because the thing is that they tried to throw me off. They tried to be like, this is the present, but then Brainy started saying something shit and I'm like he would never say that that he is he is a good man he is my boy and he would never he would never just say you know that oh I don't know if we could fully trust with you know what you think he would never do that so they but they go down and see that it's fine there he's still in the cage but a breach happens and Nia interprets the thimble to mean like sewing and that she needs to sew this breach shut but she accidentally like smashes it worse and Brainy almost gets sucked into space because Nia could not interpret her dream So then we're back in time again, and we see Jean get hit with the white flash, and he doesn't actually have a nightmare dream. He just loses, like, ten minutes of time, and he notices that everybody is basically, like, comatose with these ice blue eyes, and actually all but Brainy, uh, who is able to compartmentalize his fear in order to not be totally frozen, but he's still very much feeling it. Uh, He tells Jean that he's surrounded by balloons, uh, that that's his worst fear. And I mean, it's clearly symbolic of his fear of finally like popping from overwhelming emotion and becoming like his Kaluan ancestors. I also think it's very coded, which definitely I think gives more like 
credence to that, like, Brainy is autistically coded headcanon. Um, and I think it's also symbolic for how Brainy doesn't like unpredictable things. Like, he always relies on his, um, like, equations and his 12th level intellect to figure everything out. But if something is incalculable, then he freaks out or feels unable to stop it. Um, and then Jean says, probably in response to, um, in response to Brainy saying that his biggest fear is balloons, Jean says probably my favorite thing that he's literally ever said. He says, we don't have time to unpack all that. <laughs> so then Jean is tasked with pulling everybody out of their comas, and Jean actually goes down to uh, the containment so that he can get the phantom back in the cage. And by doing so, he's kind of planning to siphon the fan like like uh force the phantom to use his powers to attack jean so that everybody else's dreams can be weakened so that they can escape and he actually sees flashes of everybody's fears but he's able to you know like i said kind of like distract the phantom and pull everybody out of it and he says i'll show you what it's like to be afraid um <laughs> So in the final, we see then the final kind of like flashes of everybody's dreams. So in the final flashes of Alex's dreams, she shoots through the glass, says, hug her for me, and then jumps into the phantom zone, presumably to continue her transformation into a phantom and then be left in the phantom zone as a phantom forever, which is so horrifying. Uh, for Lena, she actually touches the face of the Kelpie and then it turns into her mother and then she wakes up. For Kelly, she picks up the shield that fell off the door, and she slides, and she's a badass. And, I mean, like I said, it's definitely very much a dreamer, or, or sorry, <laughs> a guardian uh, seed being planted. And I love that. I thought that was really cool, because Kelly's biggest fear is not being able to help the ones that she loves, um, and not being able to connect to them, and not being able to reach them and save them. Uh, and I think it's interesting how they pointed out how she's human and she's weak and she's this and she's that. But I think, I mean, ultimately, this episode kind of proved that despite Kelly being human or quote unquote weak, she was the strongest out of all of them because she had the tools to break herself and all of to, to help break her friends out of this fear coma. I mean, Lena used Kelly's... Um, she used Kelly's, uh, thing, uh, coping mecha mechanism in order to get herself out of this, like, coma, this fear coma. So, really, what I'm trying to say is that, like, the episode kind of proved that Kelly is not weak because of her lack of, you know, superpowers or lack of shield or whatever. She is strong because of that. But also, they also showed that she has the capacity and the capability to pick up the shield as well. And obviously, we're so excited for that. Um, and for Nia, actually Nia's ends probably, Alex and Nia's dreams end in like genuinely the saddest ways. And I think, I mean, again, that kind of goes with my point of saying like, okay, N Lena and Kelly were able to utilize Kelly's techniques in order to cope and theirs ended in like good ways. But for Alex and Nia, their dreams ended in horrible ways and they weren't able to like cope and apply those mechanisms. So for Nia, she was unable to save Brainy, and when she comes out of it, she's literally crying. It's really sad. Because <laughs> he literally just, like, whoop, whoop, gets sucked up into outer space, and then uh, Nia is crying at the cage, and then when she actually, like, when they show her again after she gets out of her coma, she literally just, like, has, like, silent tears just, like, streaking down her face. It's so upsetting. So they're all pulled out of it now, and they all have a lock on Supergirl's location. So in the Phantom Zone, Kara is utterly hopeless. Zorel shows Kara a crutch that he made himself, but Kara asks what the point of going on was. Kara says, quote, hope is naive, and that was probably the saddest line Kara has ever said, literally ever. Because she's literally a beacon of hope. Like, she believes beyond all odds, but this place, like, sucked it out of her. The idea of 
of uh, being the root cause of people's misery and pain and, and unable to save people pulls that out of her. And that's, ooh, you know, those are emotions that you don't necessarily get over super quick. And I have a feeling that, because I mean, Queller talked about in interviews that there was trauma that Kara is going to have to deal with after she gets out of the Phantom Zone. And I think that that specifically is one of the things that she's going to have to deal with is kind of the residual um, fear. Because I don't think that those visions are something that you can shake, you know, so easily. I mean, obviously, I mean, with Dreamer, her storyline is going to continue with this I don't know how to interpret my dreams storyline. So that's going to stay with her. I, I mean, I'm assuming that Lena is going to still kind of take this turn with her mother, you know, see what happens with that storyline. For Alex, I mean, same kind of thing where uh, are her emotions getting in the way of the job that she needs to be able to do? When do you need to be a soldier? When do you need to be emotional? When, how can you find that balance? And that's obviously going to be Alex's storyline continuing, especially if they take her down the path of motherhood, because then it's like, okay, when do I be out in the field and when do I protect myself and be a mom kind of thing? So that's what I can see happening with the rest of Alex's season. And so with Kara, that hopelessness and that fear, that crippling anxiety, I don't think it's going to go away. I I don't know. I just, I don't think it's going to go away. And that's what we're going to see for Kara for the rest of the season, kind of her dealing with that and obviously leaning on her friends as maybe she pulls away from them, unfortunately, you know? And I don't know. I'm just really interested to see what happens with her dealing with the hopelessness that kind of like settled in her heart uh, in the Phantom Zone. And so Zorel actually comes up to Kara and he says that he cried for Krypton, he cried for everyone, but Kara was actually able to pull him out of that f- pain and sadness and suffering by giving him hope. And he's able to use this speech to pull Kara out of her fear. And it's it's actually a pretty sweet moment. A lot of people had a lot of issues with this about saying like, okay, why was Zorel? Kara's touchstone. And I mean, I think it sets up, I think it sets up something really interesting where Kara knows all of the horrible things that her dad did. And yet here he is right in front of her. He's alive. He is talking to her. He is, he can touch her. You know, she can like touch his face And that's something that she's not been able to do since she was 13 and something that she never thought she'd ever be able to do again. You know, it's, I think it's hard to let go of the love that you have for somebody. I think it's hard to, um, I think it's hard to, to keep, to continue harboring that, that anger. You know what I mean? Like, I kind of talked about this too before with like Alora in season three about how when she reconnected with Kara, there was that moment of, okay, well, why isn't she yelling at Alora like she yelled at the hologram? And it's because her mom's alive. She's not going to yell at her mom right now, you know? And she's, she's just happy to see her. She's like, forget about all the stuff that I was mad about. Forget about, I mean, even though they're obviously valid arguments, I think the same thing goes for zor in this moment where he's just going to have to deal with, uh, or Kara is just going to have to kind of compartmentalize her anger and her emotions and the things that she has, the things that she knows about her dad and reconcile those feelings of loving him, but also having uh, anger towards him. And it's going to be interesting because he's going to be around for at least a couple of more episodes. So I'm definitely interested to see what happens. I wouldn't be surprised if at one point she did just like snap and yell at him, like fully season three on mon you know? Um, it's, it'd be interesting. Um, so it's this pretty sweet moment, though, is is interrupted by phantoms and they decide to fight, even though the phantom zone is literally like splitting around them. And then a yellow sun bomb kills all the phantoms. Kara says, that's my family. They're really here. And she flies them onto the ship and Alex and Kara share a wonderful little hug. 
and Alex says, I got you. And at the very end of the episode, Nixley is on top of the ship and she's hitching a ride to Earth. Oh, shit. <laughs> um, and I... Okay, there's a lot of drama, too, about the ending of this episode. And I mean, here's my rationale. I think that because this episode was not intentionally a mid-season finale, it was just supposed to lead into the next episode because they planned for Supergirl to just air pretty much uninterrupted uh, like Batwoman pretty much has. Batwoman's run uh, almost uninterrupted. I mean, a couple of weeks here and there where they'll be off for one Sunday, but then they'll be back the next. Um, but there's been no, uh, you know, huge, huge, huge break in, in their season. You know what I mean? I think that they intended for Supergirl to air like that, but when Superman and Lois had their COVID production problem, uh, where they had to shut down production and they lost, you know, a certain amount of time where they would not be able to air a couple of episodes because they were behind, then that's when they shoved, obviously they shoved the first seven episodes of Supergirl in that spot. And I think because, because they hadn't originally planned for that, David Harewood said that it was kind of a, a a bigger reunion at the end of this episode, or like there was at least a bit more of like time for the, uh, you know, taken for this reunion. But I think what they did is they just did the Danvers sisters hug, do the hug, and then cliffhanger. They needed to insert this cliffhanger of Nixley riding on the ship to be like ooh cliffhanger you know and it's I, I don't know if I necessarily think it worked very well or not but um <laughs> but it definitely uh I think that that's the reason why at least you know what I mean like I think that it was a higher up decision to cut out a potential like because I mean and David even said it was not everybody that was in the hug it was literally just like Jean comes in too and like hugs and so it's not like it was everybody it's uh, so I think it was just like a higher up decision to just focus on the Danvers sisters and their reunion and then we do the cliffhanger and then we'll see you in August basically you know and so I just yeah I that's, I don't know. I don't know. I think I'm just excited. I'm excited for the next episode because I just know that, um, that, you know, uh, they'll be able to do like more fun reunion. I mean, the episode is called Welcome Home Kara. 608 is called Welcome Home Kara. Um, and I think, I don't know, I, I know that they're going to kind of, like, do a, in the beginning at least, they're going to have, like, a big party for Kara to welcome her home. So, I, I'm not too mad about, <laughs> about the ending. I, it didn't bother me all that much, but, um, yeah, I don't know. I, uh, I, I mean, like I said, I, I really enjoyed the first half of this season. I think it was fun. I think it showed, it, it highlighted a lot of the strengths of the show, um, and also a lot of the weaknesses of the show. I think the only episode that was pretty weak was episode two, unfortunately. Um, that one I just, it wasn't as good as, as all the other episodes this season, but I wouldn't even call it bad. It just wasn't super great. It's kind of boring. Um, and I think, I think it kind of like goes to show that like, especially, I mean, you know, now that we're at this point, I think scenes at CatCo are kind of pointless and stupid. We just don't care about those characters that work there. <laughs> um, it's more interesting to see the Super Friends dynamic. I mean, you know, so I don't know. <laughs> But I mean, I, I really enjoyed this first half of the season. I think that they, I mean, like I said, they did a good job with what they had, with what they could muster, you know, from having to back film and then having to rush and prepare and be ready for this like seven episodes right up front that they clearly did not plan on having to do. So um, I, I don't know. I think it worked out pretty well in the end. I've, I've really enjoyed this story this season, but um 
in the uh, people were mad too though in the promo for the next episode uh it's back to catco <laughs> i mean i just talked about how much i hate catco scenes and now we're back at catco <laughs> but it's fine um so apparently kara is going to take zorel to her place of work i don't know why she keeps taking unruly men to her place of work it's always a bad idea <laughs> does it literally never works out um but that's fine that's fine uh <laughs> I mean, this is my little theory that basically Kara is using Zorel and like taking him to work and doing this or whatever, and she's using him as a distraction to not talk about the pain of the Phantom Zone and to not talk about her trauma. And I think by the end of the episode, we're going to see her have that kind of like breakdown um, with Alex or somebody else. I don't know, but yeah, I don't know. I, I like I said, I I wasn't mad at this episode. I didn't hate it. Uh, I liked it. I, I mean, I thought it was really good, honestly. I, I think the episode overall was super duper enjoyable, super fun. Um, I liked the horror references. I liked the, the diving into each of these characters' minds, especially Kelly, because we never get to see that. Um, and especially Lena, too, because that was fun, especially now that we're kind of, like, opening up this storyline for her that doesn't have anything to do with, like, being evil. <laughs> Um, and yeah, and, oh, you know what, too, Jessica and Robert, they did, <laughs> they did an interview, and listen, guys, I hate this so much. I hate that so many publications now just, like, call Karin Lena Supercorp. I hate it, but simultaneously I love it because it proves beyond proof that, like, Supercorp is queer bait. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, because they know that it gets clicks, so reporters use it, and they just ask about Kara and Lena, and they, uh, Jessica and Robert did a, an interview basically only about Kara and Lena, and saying that how their relationship was going to be much different going forward, and it's going to be interesting, and I, I just, I don't know, guys. I'm, I mean, I'm still feeling super court Ben game. I am cautiously optimistic, but, um, maybe recklessly optimistic, but, um, I don't know. I don't know. I, I always just think it's funny that they, you know, anytime something happens, like people didn't like the promo for this next episode. So people were online complaining. Then the very next day, an article about Supercorp shows up, <laughs> an interview about Supercorp shows up, whatever, you know, and it's like they just call them up and be like, hello, do you have a minute to talk about our Lord and Savior, Supercorp? Um, so yeah, I don't know. I like I said, I really liked it. Let me know what you thought. Did you like this episode? Did you think it worked as a good mid-season finale? Did you wish that the reunion was longer? What did you think? You can let me know by leaving a comment in the comments below, or you can tweet me at Televised Pod. Let me know what you think. Um, I will. I mean, like I said, no more Supergirl recaps for until August. <laughs> uh, for till college? No, for uh until August. Um, obviously because it's not airing, can't talk about it if it's not airing, um, <laughs> but, uh, I will definitely still be talking about Batwoman through the end of their season. They still have quite a few, uh, more episodes to go. I think, uh, maybe five more episodes to go after this, five or four. So there's still, you know, a couple of episodes left, a couple of weeks of Batwoman recaps coming up and then, uh, I'll figure out something to talk about in the meantime. <laughs> <laughs> and um yeah so like i said just leave me a comment below let me know what you think uh you can rate share like subscribe do all the things and i will see you guys next wednesday bye <laughs>